finish these lessons or this series of lessons within the next uh, whatever, six months or something, uh, which means we're either going to have to double up somewhere along the way, and I'll try to do that some, or we will have to leave, maybe may not get through all of the lessons, but these lessons are outlined in detail enough with sufficient scripture that it would seem that you could pretty well take this workbook and follow these lessons, follow the, the outline, look up the scriptures, and without a lot of difficulty get the lessons that are contained therein. But we will do our best to cover as many of them as we possibly can. Now, for some reason, any of you in here did not get one of these workbooks when we initially started. If you'd let that be known, we can get you one now. But I don't, I don't know if we've got any new ones in the class or not. I don't see any hands going up anywhere. <clears throat> but we are going to resume with Lesson 26. I think we got through Lesson 25 in our previous study. <clears throat> As before, we would certainly encourage you to try to keep up with these booklets because they are rather exhaustive in their study. A lot of work went into putting them together for us, so we again express appreciation of those who actually put these together. I think, I don't know who all was involved, Connie, Jan, some of the others maybe. <clears throat> the last three lessons prior to this one, we looked at the importance of worship. We looked at the object of worship, and we looked at the preparation for worship, which was basically a study of Psalm 50. And so when we understand that God is the object of our worship, that should, without question, emphasize to us the importance of worship. Jesus said in John 4, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him, in spirit and in truth. Two things are emphasized in that verse. Worship in spirit. That is, worship with the proper attitude, proper disposition, proper frame of mind, if you please. And the second aspect of it is that we worship in truth. We worship according to the truth. God has specified how He wants us to worship Him. And we have really no choice if we want to please God but to worship Him the way He has specified. And some of the lessons subsequent to this one, we will look at the specific areas of worship that are set forth in the New Testament. But tonight we want to look at the idea of the Lord's Day. Why is this so important? Simply because there are those of religious persuasion today that believe that we are still to be worshiping on the Sabbath. Uh, of course, those who are of the persuasion of the Seventh-day Adventist group believe that to be the case, and yet there are other groups. Uh, you may have noted at some point, I believe it's coming south out of Rome, uh, right on the highway there is a sign that says, Sabbath school, and I believe it is a, some branch of the Baptist church. Sabbath school. That means that they're not having Sunday school, they're having Sabbath school. That is, on Saturday. Still, it is important that we understand this principle, because much of that is tied to the concept that the Old Testament law is still in force, that we're still subject to the Old Testament law. Uh, certainly we have dealt with that in the past, but we'll deal with that a little bit in our study tonight. The Lord's Day, the first day of the week, if you please, is what we will try to establish as the day of worship is of New Testament origin. We'll show that to be the case. Under the Old Testament, 
Under the law of Moses, God's people observe the Sabbath. So we have to make the distinction between the two. And so there is that continuing difficulty among some distinguishing between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That was a problem even in the early church. If you take your New Testaments and turn to Acts chapter 15, in verse 5, you will see that to be the case. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so they were still trying to enforce even after the establishment of the church on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ, when the New Testament was basically unveiled, it was now being preached in its entirety relative to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That was the message of Peter and the others on Pentecost. And he concluded that lesson pretty much in verse 36 of Acts 2, by saying that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is the mediator of the New Testament. We just got through studying that series on the word better out of the book of Hebrews, showing that what we have now under the New Covenant, a better covenant, why would we want to go back to something of less significance, that is, the law of Moses. So there was a problem in the early church. Some religions of today, already noticed, would bind the law of Moses and insist on the Sabbath as the day of worship. I've noted this before recently. When you see those signs and the emphasis that is being placed on the, the Ten Commandments, and a lot of religious people are, are sticking those signs of the Ten Commandments up in their yards. But uh, my understanding of their religious belief is, while they're trying to, to uphold the idea that we're still under the Ten Commandments, in practice they're saying, yeah, we're still under the Ten Commandments, but we're only going to observe nine of them. We're not going to observe the Sabbath, because most of those who are promoting the Ten Commandments are not keeping but nine of them, in essence. Why is that? Because of a misunderstanding of the Old and the New Testament. The law has been changed. And we're not going to take the time to look at all of the section in Hebrews chapter 7. But I want to notice one or two statements in that chapter with you. In Matthew chapter 7, you'll notice in verse 11 beginning, and we noted in the outline the first 25 verses of that chapter. But in verse 11, he says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for unto it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now, who is that priest that was called after the order of Melchizedek, but not after the order of Aaron, Christ, earlier in this very book, he talks about, the writer talks about Christ as our high priest. He is a better high priest than those under the Levitical system. So now we have a different high priest. To be a priest or high priest under the Old Testament system, of what tribe must that person be? Tribe of Levi. That was the Levitical, the uh, priestly tribe, the tribe of, of Levi. Now look at verse 12, and he explains why that is the case. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. You know, there are several passages in the New Testament that to us are seemingly relatively plain. What does he say right here in Hebrews seven twelve? There is a change in the law. 
based upon the fact there is a change in the priesthood. So if we're still under the law of Moses, anyone today who would claim to be a priest would have to prove what? That they are descendants of Levi. Otherwise, they couldn't serve as priests. Who are priests under the new law? All Christians. Peter makes that clear in his uh, writings. He talks about a royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people. You know that section of Scripture. And so there's been a change in the priesthood. It's not just those from the tribe of Levi, but now everyone who is a child of God is a priest. There's not a, a specific segment of God's people today who are priests in opposition to everybody else who's a child of God. That's not the way it is under the law of Moses. So then we've noted in the outline point one reasons why Christians do not observe the Sabbath. Now we're going back and I think we've got uh, a number of passages here that are probably not in your outline, so I'm going to give you some of them and you can make note of them or whatever. We're going to Exodus chapter 16 to begin with, and again that is not in your outline. Exodus chapter 16, and we're going to look at uh, verse 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that which ye will see, and that which remaineth overlay up for you, to be kept until the morning. Look in verse 25. And Moses said, Eat that today. For today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. So if you're going to observe the Sabbath, what's involved? According to this verse, or these verses. You can't cook anything on the Sabbath. You've got to prepare it the day before and lay it up for the Sabbath. Restriction. Then... Uh, he says it's not going to be found in the field in that regard. Back in, uh, or on over in chapter 20 of Exodus, and in verse 8, you have the specific commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Incidentally, lest I forget it later on, does God command in verse 7, remember every Sabbath day to keep it holy. Huh? He doesn't word it like that. But what is the implication? Every one of them. Why is that significant? Because when we get the New Testament and, and the Lord's Supper, which we'll study later on, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, the argument from those who want to take of it once a month, once a quarter, once every six months, once a year, is that he doesn't say every Lord's Day. Neither did he say every Sabbath. But Israel understood that the Sabbath meant the Sabbath whenever it came around. The Lord doesn't have to say every Sabbath, nor does he have to say every Lord's Day. Whenever there is a first day of the week, whenever there is a Lord's Day, Whatever is to be done on that day is understood to be done on every one of them. We'll get more into that later on, but I think it's a, a point well made from this section of Scripture. Now turn over to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. Deuteronomy, chapter 5, and in verse 15. Here we will find the purpose of the Sabbath. Why was it even given to start with? Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. 
So what was the purpose of the Sabbath then, according to this verse? Huh? All right. It was set up as a day, in essence, a memorial day of their being delivered out of Egyptian bondage by the hand of God. Do you fit into that category? No, I, I wasn't in Egypt in bondage, were you? My descendants were not in Egyptian bondage, were yours? Absolutely not. Here is a memorial for a specific group of people. We'll see that even more as we look at some other verses. Um, matter of fact, if you back up to uh, verses 2 and 3, you'll see it very plain. He talks about the Lord our God made a covenant with whom? With us. Who is that? Moses speaking to a second generation of Israel. God made a covenant with us. Where? In Horeb. What, what covenant was made in Horeb? Law was given, wasn't it? What, what covenant is he talking about here? Look at what he said. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount, out of the midst of fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount. And then he goes on to talk about it. Uh, and he talks about in verse 6, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Then he goes ahead and talks about those commandments that were given. But notice the phraseology. The covenant made with us. Not, Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all alive here this day. Now, if there was ever any doubt about those with whom the Lord made this covenant, which involved the keeping of the Sabbath, Moses makes it clear in this admonition to the second generation of Israel. So when you remember, number one, to whom it was given, those who were brought out of Egypt, and you remember the purpose for which it was given as a memorial of that deliverance, then why would we today, Gentiles, be prone to keep the Sabbath? It was not made with the Gentiles. It was not a memorial for the Gentiles. It was made with Israel as a memorial for Israel. Moses is very plain in that regard. So, you know, you could just look at a, a series of questions here. In that regard, are you a Jew? Well, I'm not. Don't think any of you are. Were you delivered from Egypt, from Egyptian bondage? I wasn't. Were you? Don't think so. So, do you, if you keep the Sabbath, do you do it in remembrance of deliverance from bondage? Even those who keep the Sabbath today don't keep it for the purpose for which it was designed to be kept. And so just because somebody worships on the Sabbath, if they're not doing it as a memorial of deliverance out of Egyptian bondage, which doesn't fit them anyway, then they're observing it for the wrong purpose, which is not in compliance with the will of God. So it was a sign between God and Israel concerning their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Turn back to Exodus chapter 31, and we'll see that. In verses 13 through 17, verse 12 beginning, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that has sanctified you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath thereof, for it is the holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doth any work therein, 
that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Who all, whosoever doth any work in the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, something that we'll notice, um, that I'll just look down to point D just a minute, under the reasons here, A, B, C, D. The idea of a perpetual covenant. Now you'll notice the Lord spoke to Moses and said repeatedly here, this is a sign between God and whom? Israel. Very plain about that. But he does say that it is, a, it is something to be observed throughout their generations. And he does use the word perpetual covenant in this section of Scripture. And so some want to play out that idea of a perpetual covenant by saying that it would never end. What is the idea of a perpetual covenant? What is the qualification that God, through Moses, gives in explanation of the perpetual covenant throughout their generation? Today, where is the nation of Israel as God's special people as they were then? Physically. They don't exist. They don't exist. Now, there is a nation of Israel, but how much more important is the nation, physical nation of Israel today than the physical nation of America? Or the inhabitants of Israel as opposed to the inhabitants of America? None whatsoever. They don't exist in the same framework that they existed when this covenant was made with them. And so it did last throughout their generations. But when they rebelled against God to the point that God gave them up, brought Christ in, new covenant in, new system in, and now, as the answer was given a minute ago, who is the Israel of God today? The church, spiritually, not physically and nationally, as when this was given. This nation doesn't exist as a special people to God today. And so it did last, as God promised, throughout their generations. But it no longer exists as a nation of God's special people. As we've already noted in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 3, and uh, you have other passages there. We're going back up now to point A, number two. Given after God's deliverance of Israel, He brought them out of Egyptian bondage. They came to Mount Sinai. The law was given, which included, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And so that Sabbath was given as a memorial day of that deliverance that had already taken place. Nehemiah chapter 9 talks about the same thing. Exodus, or Ezekiel rather, chapter 20, talks about the same thing. Thus, it was observed as a sign between God and Israel, not all nations. Never was it designed for that purpose. And so, these passages you really need to at least keep in your mind is where you can locate them. When you're discussing with people about the, the law of Moses, and specifically the concept of the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, which is included in the Ten Commandments. It was never given to the Gentile world to start with. And so for Gentile people especially, 
to try to uphold the Ten Commandments as a law under which they're living. They're trying to live under a law that was never given to them to start with. And these verses very clearly say that. If we'll just kind of underscore them. So, so what I would recommend that you do, maybe in the margin of your Bible or whatever, uh, go to a passage like um, uh, Galatians chapter 3, where he talks about the law as a schoolmaster but no longer under schoolmaster. Or Romans chapter 7, verse 4, we're dead to the law that we can be married to Christ. Or, or passages like that. And put out in your margin some of these passages like you know, Exodus 16, Deuteronomy 5, Exodus 31, Nehemiah chapter 9. Put these Old Testament passages out there. And then when you're studying with someone about the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses, then you've got these reference ready in hand to go back and you can say to those people, see, this law was never given to you to start with. Yes, sir. According to these verses that we've read, now he mentions that seventh day rest of the creation, but he specifically says here that the Sabbath was given as a memorial of their deliverance by his arm out of Egyptian bondage. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing, you know, that, that I'm trying to emphasize here is, is that that's really the purpose that God said through Moses, well, the purpose of the Sabbath. Exactly. So, kind of keep that in mind as you are studying with people in that regard. Now, regarding that law, and again, um, Hebrews chapter 7, uh, we looked at that briefly a moment ago. Uh, the law of the Sabbath has been abolished, basically the law of Moses, which contained the Ten Commandments, which contained the remember the Sabbath, keep it holy command, has been abolished. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 deals with that very same thing. But I think there's an interesting passage in the book of Hosea. In Hosea chapter 2 and verse 11, when God was uh, through Hosea, and incidentally when you uh, look through the book of Hosea, you're going to see a, a number of reasons why God is punishing and ultimately going to end the existence of the nation of Israel as His special people. And in that, in chapter 2 and verse 11, within the things that He says, His judgments against them, I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, watch it, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. He's going to bring an end to that. So Hosea even prophesied that there was coming a time when the Sabbath days would be no more. And Paul in Colossians 2, the Hebrews writer, Hebrews 7, shows the fulfillment of that very clearly. Then you have other passages that we don't have the time to look at uh, tonight, but um, Romans chapter 7, we've already noted uh, the word abolish is used relative uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to look at that just briefly, it uh, might be worth our time to, to look at that section. Ephesians chapter 2, um, in verse 11 beginning, and we won't read all of it, but, but I want you to notice specifically in this context, he talks about uh, those who were not a part of, uh, they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, etc. Verse 12, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you sometime were far off and made nigh by the blood of Christ. You'll notice he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The word abolish there means to reduce to inactivity. That's what the word simply means. 
So he has re reduced the law that contained the ordinances, the commandments. He's brought it to a point of inactivity. It's no longer active. It's no longer a law by which we live our lives. So he's made it very clear in that regard. So those who justify themselves in, this, in Sabbath keeping or anything else by the law are severed from Christ and fallen from grace. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now we've taken a lot of time with this first section of this lesson, but I think it's necessary to do that. Because that is the one of the most major points of division or resulting in division in the religious world is a total misunderstanding of the place of the law of Moses, Sabbath keeping, that kind of thing. And if you'll read these passages in Exodus and Deuteronomy and the others that we've given, it could not be more plain as to whom they were given and the purpose for which they were given. And that should solve the problem if folks are open-minded in that regard. So, We've already noted some degree point D there. Um, yes. Okay. All right. And, and that's, I think that's something All right. Here's here's and we've tried. We've a matter of fact, just recently somewhere I brought that up, and that's a good point. There's a difference between law and principle. See, and the principle upon which the Old Testament law was based goes all the way back to creation. Don't kill. Thou shalt not murder. Didn't begin with the Ten Commandments. That principle was in existence at the very beginning. That's why it was such a thing for Cain to kill his brother Abel. Violation of God's law. So the principles of those commandments are incorporated, and those are the principles upon which the new law are, are built. I've often illustrated like this. You're driving down the street out here, and you see a, a speed sign that says 45 mile an hour. What's the principle behind that law? Safety. You drive down the street tomorrow, and all of a sudden it says speed limit 35. What's happened? Same law? No. The law has changed from 45 to 35. But what about the principle upon which that law is based? Same principle. That's what you have within the old law and the new. The principles are there. And that's why a lot of people, I've heard even members of the church say, well, the Ten Commandments were actually brought over into the New Testament. No, they were not. The Ten Commandments were abolished. But the principle upon which they were built is used in the New Testament. And so you have, I think you use similar commands as you have under the law. But the Ten Commandments were not brought over into the New Testament. The principle was brought over, but not the law itself. The law was abolished according to Paul in the Ephesian letter. And so we have to be careful here, and it's, it, it's a little, <laughs> one of those situations where you have to understand the language you're using. We're not talking law, we're talking principle now. The law has been abolished. Principle carried on, indeed. And that's why you have so much similarity in the New Testament, similar to the Ten Commandments, that you have in the Ten Commandments themselves, because they are built upon the same principles. So thanks, Jim, for bringing that up. Yes. ACLU says he can't have that 
Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the bottom line is I, I personally don't, uh, don't fault Roy Moore for, for standing for the principles of the Ten Commandments and making a stand. Now, he lost his job there. He's now running for governor in Alabama. But the fact is, the fact is he lost his job for standing up for what's right. Right. For what's good. Principles. For the principles. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. those. All right. So uh, I think it's a real sad commentary that you, you know if you want to if you want to put the Ten Commandments in, up on, in your yard to say that these are the kinds of principles I live by, absolutely. But these are the kinds of principles I live by. Now, do I say that that I'm uh, held by the law of Moses? No. Do I want to give the impression I'm held by the law of Moses? No. And that's what you would do if you put the Ten Commandments in your front yard. But. but I'm, Turn back to Acts chapter 30 just a minute. I want to make one other point rather hurriedly. Um, Exodus chapter 30 and in verse 8. And this goes back to this idea of some trying to hold on to that concept of a perpetual covenant. Was that the first? That wasn't the second bell, was it? That first bell, right? All right, in the Exodus chapter 30 and verse 8, And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even... He shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now, if the Sabbath being a perpetual thing, perpetual covenant, means it still ought to be going on today, what about the burning of incense? Because the same thing is said about it that is said about the Sabbath. It's a perpetual covenant throughout your generation. So you can't have it, you know, one way without the other. You, you can't just take the part you want and leave what you don't want. If you're going to make the Sabbath a perpetual covenant for today, then you better be burning incense because the same thing is said about both. I just wanted to show you that. It's in the outline, and you can, you can pick up on that. So then there are several other things in connection with this that under... Uh, uh, point two there, the, the significance of the Lord's Day. And when you think about uh, those things that, uh, that uh, were associated with the first day of the week, uh, I think we'll see some of the importance in that regard. Christ raised from the dead, met with His disciples, Holy Spirit came, church began, gospel began to be preached. And then, of course, when you come to the observance in the New Testament, you have uh, passages like Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. How often did Jesus say do it? Or when did He say do it? Did Jesus say when to do it? Did Jesus say when to do it? No. He said as often as you do it. But now in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, what do we have all of a sudden? We have an approved example. Now that goes back to establishing Bible authority a little bit, upon which we're going to have an entire lectureship here in October on the matter of authority. But, but until we understand how to establish Bible authority, Acts chapter 20 verse 7 might mean so much. But there is an approved example. The Lord said, as often as you do it, how often did the, the apostles do it? On the first day of the week. You have the same thing with the reference to the uh, matter of giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. I've always found it interesting that people who want to argue that you don't have to take the Lord's Supper every first day are always anxious to take up a collection every first day. I found that a bit inconsistent, say the least. Same principle. Exactly. So uh, notice some of those things in that regard. So the Lord's Day. It's not the Sabbath day. And I believe these passages that we've given uh, detailed attention to this evening should help us in our discussions with religious people about the Sabbath, about the law of Moses, and other things pertaining thereto. To whom was it given, and for what purpose was it given? And then uh, you should have something to say. Roger, you had your hand up a minute ago.
That's true. And some people try to argue that when the law came in, the Jews were under it and the Gentiles didn't even have a law. That's foolish. Gentiles didn't have a law. They didn't have sin. The sin's violation of law, transgression of law. And so that patriarchal system remained for the Gentile world, as you said, I, I, and I agree with you in that regard, until the gospel began to be preached to the Gentile world. And, of course, Cornelius, Acts uh, chapter 10. It's, Yeah. From that time on, we've done something that you system. Everybody. Right. Exactly. All right. It's time for the second bell. Keep those in your Bible so you can use them when you need them.